Welcome everyone. I'm Caleb Nelson, the moderator for this panel on constitutional history. We have a terrific <laughs> slate of papers to discuss, so I want to get right into it. Our distinguished panel consists of Chris Schmidt of the Chicago Kent College of Law, Mark Graber of the University of Maryland, and David Schwartz of the University of Wisconsin. After their presentations, I'll make some comments to which they can respond if they like, but we'll save at least 20 minutes for questions and maybe a little more than that. To get on the queue, as in the previous panel, just use the chat function to indicate to me that you have a question. The papers are really good, so we're in for a treat. First up is Professor Schmidt, who will be presenting his paper, 13th Amendment Echoes in 14th Amendment Doctrine. Take it away, Chris. All right, thank you so much, Caleb. And uh, thank you once again to the organizers of this terrific conference. Of course, we're all sad not to be in Arizona, but uh, next year, hopefully we'll be back. So I am going to uh, have some slides just so you have some visuals to go along with my presentation and give a, a brief overview of the article. So I'm gonna to go to screen share here. See that okay? <laughs> So uh, the title of my paper is 13th Amendment Echoes and 14th Amendment Doctrine. And what I'm going to do is just talk through a little bit about how I came to this topic and then try and give a summary of what I'm uh, doing in this paper. So uh, this paper is a convergence of two different uh, streams of thought. One is um, teaching constitutional law and uh, coming to, um, consistent observations about the way the law is as I teach it in terms of how I teach my constitutional law students the rules of how constitutional law works, particularly looking at 14th Amendment Equal Protection Doctrine, and talking about what these rules are, but then also observing that the rules, again, state action doctrine, tiers of scrutiny, I don't need to go through that in much detail here. Uh, you teach the black letter law, and then you apply it to the cases, and when I go to the cases, that are oftentimes most meaningful to me in terms of understanding the development of the equality principle of constitutional law, I oftentimes have to confess to my students that the rules really don't apply. And I come up with this little line about how the great cases tend to break the rules, sometimes because they're transitional cases, but then it's oftentimes just hard to place these cases in the broader stream of constitutional law. So that's observation one. Uh, the other stream from which this paper emerged is the last few years I've been working on uh, a short book, which just was published last month titled Civil Rights in America, which is basically a history of the term civil rights from the reconstruction era through today. Follow how this term has been used, how its meaning has been defined and redefined by different generations. And this book caused me to spend a lot of time with the reconstruction era and particularly with this term civil rights, which uh, had a quite different meaning to the reconstruction era generation, particularly those people involved in lawmaking and constitutional reconstruction, uh, and understanding how they understood this concept of civil rights. And eventually uh, I came to the conclusion that this 19th century version of civil rights actually has some uh, lingering effects in terms of the basic principle at the core of this concept of civil rights in the Reconstruction era that I think um, permeate through 14th Amendment doctrine as it developed in the subsequent century and a half and helps to explain some of these uh, so-called rule breakers in our constitutional tradition. So this is where this paper came from, this convergence of these two ideas. Uh, what I did for this paper is I took the concept of civil rights as it was uh, formulated in the Reconstruction period and soon thereafter uh, and turned into a more generalized principle, which I gave the label equality of rights. Uh, the label, I've never been fully happy with it. It does have the benefit of actually having some historical grounding and that the um, reconstruction generation sometimes did refer to this concept of equality of rights. But equality of rights as a principle that I use in this paper is a generalized version of the reconstruction era conception of civil rights. And it's one that I argue can be uh, generalized in such a way that applies uh, not just to racial discrimination. The definition of this, uh, basically, uh, as I use it, is this uh, idea that the strength of the 14th Amendment is non-discrimination requirement, and I will say uh, predominantly equal protection doctrine, but as I go through the history, it's not always based in equal protection, in equal protection clause. It can vary in relation to the importance of the sphere of activity at issue. I'd say this assumption was uh, relatively prosaic to the Reconstruction generation, but I will say the subsequent generations 
of lawyers and judges have struggled with this, even though there's a very commonsensical element to this in terms of how it could translate into the doctrine. I'd say there's a lot of resistance. And I'd also argue that the current rule set that we teach our students doesn't really take this into account. So my argument is predominantly a descriptive one in that I argue that assumptions about liberty and equality that have been associated with the 13th Amendment, this idea of equality of rights, which I do trace to the 13th Amendment, have operated in powerful but overlooked ways in the development of the 14th Amendment doctrine. And this is just describing uh, what I argue is a better way of uh, understanding how the 14th Amendment non-discrimination principle has uh, evolved over its history. There is also a normative piece to this paper. I do less with this, but that's just basically the idea that if we actually take this equality of rights principle into account and embrace it as a legitimate uh, approach to the 14th Amendment, our doctrine would be better for it. Um, it's a bit of an add-on to the paper. I'm still deciding how much weight to put on the normative piece. Overview of the paper, a roughly chronological uh, unfolding. Start off with the reconstruction period where I trace the beginnings of this concept of civil rights, again, which I generalized into the equality rights principle. I talk about how it developed, how the early Supreme Court um, de dealt with the issue, and then why this early version of civil rights was obscured in various ways, um, but nonetheless, why it also lingered on as a concept. And I trace this through cases involving racial discrimination, cases involving state action doctrine. And then uh, I look to cases going beyond race where I argue the principle has this uh, uh, lingering effect. So with the remaining uh, minutes of my time, I'm just gonna walk through uh, this, uh, the general points from this paper. So beginning, with uh, the birth of this concept of civil rights or equality of rights. Uh, this is basically a dynamic that um, we, can, we can identify here. It was born in the 13th Amendment. It was then codified in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And then it was constitutionalized through the 14th Amendment. But the basic argument here is that these three sort of um, formative uh, legal texts for this equality rights principle were seen as very much working together in conjunction with one another. Uh, 13th Amendment, we know that. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 is key to the uh, genealogy of this concept. And the two key parts for the 1866 Act that we want to make sure you keep in mind is that it was an anti-discrimination um, policy in terms of there's a uh, protection against discriminatory treatment with uh, white citizens as a baseline for what that discrimination um, would be limited as. But it was also a non-discrimination principle that was targeted or limited in that it did apply to certain realms of society and uh, presumptively not to others. And it applied to contracts, to going to court, uh, to property, to personal protection. But beyond that, it was actually left unprotected, at least by the text of the 1866 law. Uh, the assumptions about what the protections uh, in the 1866 law, which was based on Section 2 of the 13th Amendment, were then part of what went into the 14th Amendment. And of course, there's a lot of history here in terms of what goes into this. But most readings of the 14th Amendment would say that at a minimum, it was understood to be a constitutionalization of the core protections of that 1866 law. Exactly where these protections were located doctrinally is actually not super clear. Um, it just there was not a lot of evidence in terms of how the framers envisioned the separate work of the key provisions of the section one of the 14th Amendment, arguably probably the most logical home for this concept of civil rights uh, would be in the privileges or immunities clause. And indeed, an early version of the 14th Amendment did include a protection uh, against civil right uh, protection against discrimination in civil rights, and that was removed and the privileges and immunities clause came in soon thereafter. Now turning to how it uh, fared in the court. Um, a few stages I wanna uh, highlight here. One is that the very early Supreme Court cases interpreting the 14th Amendment took an aggregative approach to the Reconstruction Amendments and that they oftentimes batched them together, particularly the 13th and 14th Amendment and talked about things like, as the Slaughterhouse cases famously wrote, the one pervading purpose. And the idea here is that the early jurors who are charged with trying to interpret the meaning of the Reconstruction Amendments oftentimes did look at them in conjunction with one another, looked at the 13th, 14th, and sometimes 15th Amendments working together. One way to understand cases like the civil rights cases in Plessy versus Ferguson, where the Supreme Court um, limited the scope of the protections of the Reconstruction Amendments was a disaggregation of the 13th and 14th Amendments. 
uh, we have this argument about the 13th Amendment is just going to be applied to basically situations which were analogous analogous to slavery, right? And this is that running the slavery argument to the ground language in a majority opinion of the civil rights cases. And you do actually see the justices more carefully separating the 13th and 14th Amendment, and at least in the civil rights cases, and Plessy versus Ferguson is sort of a divide and dismiss approach. You divide it up, each one of them is in some ways weaker for that division, and then you apply each to the case at hand and say that um, the uh, 14th Amendment uh, doesn't apply in these cases. Uh, the great dissenter, John Marshall Harlan, um, you know, if you try and read through his opinions in the civil rights cases in Plessy versus Ferguson, they're kind of a head scratching because he bobs around his arguments in, in sometimes confusing ways. But one of the confusions, I think, is that the expectation that he would interpret each uh, amendment, 13th and 14th Amendment, because they are both at issue in these cases uh, independently, he doesn't really do that. He kind of blends them together. And I do argue that this is partly based in his very robust conception of this idea of civil rights. Again, this non-discrimination principle that was not uh, sweeping, but was actually targeted, right? So he would define that certain rights, rights of a character so necessary and so uh, supreme that basically they are based on the conditions of freedom that those rights cannot be discriminated against based on race. And that's the driving rationale, a robust conception of civil rights, which he uh, sort of traces both to the 13th and 14th Amendment, sometimes slides back and forth between the two. And that really does the work of his analysis in both the civil rights cases and Plessy's dissent. Uh, so again, here we have a sort of pushback against a broad reading of the civil rights as well as Harlan's alternative view. At this point, the paper then goes forward in time, traces why this uh, reconstruction era concept of civil rights was obscured. There's various arguments I bring in here, partly doctrine. I mean, this is going back to the familiar history of the demise of the privileges or immunities clause in the slaughterhouse cases, which would have been the most logical uh, textual vehicle for a robust conception of civil rights. Language is connects back to the book I wrote in which the term civil rights itself lost its connotation of being applied to these sort of natural rights based ideas uh, applied to different uh, claims such as public accommodations specifically or eventually to racial equality claims more generally in the 20th century. And then also politics. This idea of civil rights um, didn't really have a lot of defenders, right? If you look at uh, African-American activists during this period, they weren't fighting for civil rights. Civil rights is a term of law that really limited their visions of equality and justice as much as, any, as, much as anything else. Uh, so it wasn't really a, sort of a, a term that had much resonance outside the language of the law. And eventually this older concept of civil rights basically went away. But I argue it still had some residual effects in the doctrine. I go through Buchanan versus Worley and Brown versus Board. Uh, we can talk about more of this later if anyone wants to. The basic assumption behind both these decisions is that the court actually applied a non-discrimination principle, not as a general matter. They never said that the racial discrimination as a general matter was unconstitutional in either Buchanan or Brown, but they said it was unconstitutional in the case at hand because of the particular area that was at issue, Buchanan versus Worley having to do with property, Brown with education. Uh, I also apply it to some state action cases. Again, this, a similar theme of Shelley versus Kramer and, and Bell, I look at um, Justice Goldberg's dissent. They're trying to basically say why the state action doctrine would apply differently in racial discrimination cases having to do with certain realms of society, Shelley, property, Bell versus Maryland, public accommodations, and to craft an argument in which the state action doctrine would actually not be transubstantive but would apply in sort of targeted ways in, to different areas, different kinds of discrimination in different realms of society, which I argue actually has some basis in this older concept of civil rights or equality rights principle. And then I, sort of, I try to see where you see some uh, of these echoes coming up. If uh, anyone recalls Thurgood Marshall's efforts in the 1970s to push back against tiers of uh, scrutiny, actually uh, similar to some of this. I think Plyler is actually a really nice case where um, in terms of the doctrinal justification offered in Justice Brennan's majority opinion, it's a little bit all over the place, but if you actually apply um, this concept of equality of rights, it's, it's relatively easily, uh, easily justified as based in both a non-discrimination principle as well as uh, recognition of education as not being a run of the mill form of discrimination and perhaps also tracing it up to the Obergefell decision. So I think uh, I'm at my 12 minutes. So I will stop there and I look forward to hearing anyone's thoughts and reactions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Next up is Mark Graber, who will present Korematsu's ancestors. Um.
go on my screen share here. One second, I'll just wait. My paper really follows from Chris's paper and I could probably use his slides, but that may not be the best idea. Um, and again, for those of you who are veterans of conferences, this may be the first time that papers actually follow each other. What I'm doing in this paper is writing a very short history of the constitutional law of race classifications. What was the textual hook? What was the standard? And who was expected to implement that law? One point of this is we tend to think well, Korematsu may have weaknesses in strict scrutiny, but it's a lot better than what was previous. I want to raise some questions about that. I also want to raise some questions about originalism. This paper is not simply of the form that we take Highway 95, they took Highway 40. It is rather Highway 40 has now been so plowed up, replaced by an apartment complex and a shopping mall, we can't restore it. Now I'll emphasize I'm talking about race classifications. I'm not talking about what constitutes a race classification. Neutral laws that are designed to discriminate, think Williams versus Mississippi, not part of this paper. Neutral laws that do discriminate, Washington versus Davis, not part of the paper. These laws are extraordinarily important, uh, I just, in 75 pages of overriding decided, if I were to include them, it would no longer be a paper, but another three volume book. We start with the antebellum United States and a crucial feature of that was actually Professor Schmidt really was talking about, namely they are not as clause obsessed as we are. They don't say, you know, here are 11 clauses in the state constitution, and this is state law. We're now going to distinguish the meaning of each so we can show each of the 11 has a discrete meaning. Rather, when they talk about equality, they say our constitution is committed to equality. Look at all the clauses that to some degree express equality. And the crucial rule is not that we have identical treatment, but that all disparate treatment must be based on real differences between the affected classes and serve the public welfare. And everybody agrees, or pretty much everybody outside of a few crazy abolitionists agree, there are real differences between white people and persons of color that justify discrimination. The first real difference is white people are citizens. In virtually all states, African Americans are not. The second difference is are all the racial differences of scientific racism of the 19th century, which I don't have to review and condemn in this group. The judiciary polices equality, they're the people that implement the constitution. We then move to what I call the Turner regime. After a case in Ray Turner discussed by Chief Justice Salmon Chase on circuit. Turner regime has a couple of interesting features. First, once again, I'm following Chris's act the law of equality is rooted in the 13th Amendment. And rooting the law of the equality in the 13th Amendment has two important consequences. First, there is no state action requirement. Turner is actually a case of an indentured servitude where though Chase refers to a Maryland law, what's equally important is this guy who owns a former plantation is treating white indentured servants differently than African-American indentured servants. Second, because the 13th Amendment is designed to prevent slavery in a slave system, it focuses on the condition of African-Americans. <clears throat> so Congress 
relying on 13th Amendment understanding of equality during Reconstruction can pass race conscious legislation that the Democrats hate. But Republicans say, no, we're simply getting rid of the slave system. And part of the feature of a slave system is discrimination against African Americans. It's not a feature of the slave system that there might be discrimination against whites. And a crucial feature of the 13th Amendment is something the paper refers to as legislative primacy. Legislatures are expected to act first. Courts may determine whether legislatures have acted constitutionally, but courts are not expected to implement the 13th Amendment on their own, maybe in a few extreme cases. But implementation is left up to Congress with courts reacting. We then move to Strauder, the Strauder regime. And one of the things the Strauder regime exhibits First, I think manifested in Slaughterhouse. Remember in Slaughterhouse, after talking about the one pervading purpose, the court does something no court would do before antebellum United States. Well, here's the privileges and immunity clause. This is what that means. Here's the equal protection clause. This is what that means. Here is a due process clause. This is what that means. And I'm reminded all the time, by the way, I do a lot of hand gestures. They don't mean anything in my class. They mean less than nothing on Zoom and I apologize. But by Strauder, the law of race classification is becoming located in the Equal Protection Clause, which means we have a state action doctrine, which means we're now more concerned with equal treatment for everybody. But Strauder moves now to what Ronald Dworkin called ban categories. If it's a race discrimination, it's banned, period. There is no balancing test. But Strauder remains committed to legislative primacy. In Ray, Virginia, which is a companion opinion, says, this provision, the 14th Amendment, is directed at Congress. What we do as a court is evaluate congressional legislation. We do not look at race classifications on their own. We then move to Plessy, and this is, you know, the 12-minute the tour. It's going very fast. And Plessy continues the Slaughterhouse story, the 13th Amendment, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, Due Process Clause, all have distinctive meanings. But Plessy now adds a difference between race discriminations which are per se unconstitutional. If you give African-Americans more or less than what you give white people, that's unconstitutional. But you now have race distinctions. If you give African-Americans the equivalent of what you're giving white Americans, that's OK. Separate but equal, we all know. But even if, we, if you give African-Americans something that's just as good because of the nature of African-Americans, Harlan says in Cummings, instead of giving them a high school, we're giving them more money for their elementary school, just as good constitutional. But what Plessy does, and it's rather interesting, Plessy is the first case when nobody cares that there's no federal statute. Plessy decided in 1875 might have simply been, Congress hasn't passed a, a federal statute on this, we can't rule. Plessy, like the freedom of contracts cases, treats the absence of a federal statute as irrelevant. It's rather fascinating in this way, Plessy makes Brown possible. In a system of legislative primacy, while Congress could declare segregated schools unconstitutional, courts could not. Plessy, by getting rid of legislative primacy and burying it, makes Brown possible. We then get to Korematsu, 
Korematsa, we're still on the equal protection clause. We're even more clause obsessed. Though we add reverse incorporation, now it's both the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment and the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. When we talk of the federal government, there's a bit of a revival of the 13th Amendment in Jones v. Alfred Mayer that goes almost nowhere. Judicial supremacy is the law of the land. And in fact, the courts make clear when you go beyond what we, the courts, think the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause is, we kill it. And strict scrutiny, we now have a balancing test. The thumb is against racial classification, but it is a balancing test. Now, what I want to highlight in this, because I think I'm coming to the end of my time, is notice the Korematsu regime obviously looks better when compared to antebellum. But what you think of it may depend on what you think of some other things. So for those who favor affirmative action, you might want strict scrutiny or something even less from a court who can tell a welcome mat from a kick in the stomach. You don't want a banned categories. Do you like state action? A 13th Amendment law of racial classification gets rid of state action. 14th Amendment has it. And by the way, the 13th Amendment law is particularly friendly to affirmative action because it is primarily concerned with African-Americans. Who do you trust with respect to racial classifications? Leslie Goldstein has a wonderful book that argues for most of American history, courts have been better, but courts were not better from 1865 to 1875. And I suspect if you are a progressive, you are likely to think that courts are likely to be better enforcing what you think is a good law of racial classification in the near future. I'm sorry, Congress is likely to be better than what you think of courts in the near future. I'll now take a breath and let someone else try to summarize a long paper in 12 minutes. Thank you, Mark. Next up is Professor Schwartz, who will present his paper, Recovering the Lost General Welfare Clause. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see my, uh, my PowerPoint? Great. Um, throughout his post-Philadelphia convention life, James Madison hated the General Welfare Clause, and that's the 13 words in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, empowering Congress to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. In 1830, Madison wrote a long letter to Virginia Congressman and Speaker of the House, Adam Stevenson. And he asked rhetorically, why is it that the terms common defense and general welfare, if not meant to convey the comprehensive power, which taken literally they express, were not qualified and explained? to be more limited by explicit language. In short, Madison understood the literal meaning of the general welfare clause to empower Congress to legislate for the general welfare. So why not construe the words literally? Madison sat on the committee at the convention that drafted this clause. So he would have known the answer to this question from personal knowledge, but his answer in 1830 was evasive and unconvincing. Here's what he said. The omission of explanatory limiting language is accounted for by an inattention to the phraseology. Inattention, really? This from a man who made four separate speeches on the precise wording of the treason clause. Madison's first effort to explain away the general welfare clause came in Federalist 41. And he tried again in the Virginia Report of 1800 and again in his 1817 veto of the bonus bill. In 1826, he wrote a letter to Martin Van Buren proposing that the general welfare clause was so dangerous that it ought to be removed by a constitutional amendment. Now, 
if as is conventionally supposed, the Constitutional Convention was committed to the idea of limited enumerated powers, then why did it adopt language that is so dangerously ambiguous to that idea? Language that on its face seems to convey a general power to legislate on all national concerns and whose more limited interpretations require reference to contextual factors. The answer I argue is that the convention was not committed to limited enumerated powers. Of course, there was a limited enumerated powers faction at the convention, but there was also a powerful faction of nationalists led by James Wilson and Governor Morris of Pennsylvania that favored empowering Congress to legislate for the general welfare, that is on all national matters. In the absence of a dominant consensus on either of these two views, an ad hoc committee proposed and the convention approved compromise language that, that ends up in Article 8, Section, uh, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, compromise language that papered over these two divergent positions using strategically ambiguous language. The General Welfare Clause was written to permit both a general welfare interpretation, one that Congress could legislate for the general welfare, and a narrower interpretation consistent with limited enumerated powers. Now, it's conventional to view the General Welfare Clause as a debate over the spending power, that it confers a spending, it enumerates a so-called spending power, and the constitutional debate was limited to a Madisonian interpretation, one that Congress could spend only within the confines of its limited enumerated powers, and a Hamiltonian interpretation that Congress can spend for any national purpose. The Hamiltonian interpretation won out, as we know, um, in history. It, it was a, a embraced by the Supreme Court in United States versus Butler in 1936. But this debate obscures two additional interpretations. And these, I argue, were the two dominant interpretations at the Constitutional Convention. One was espoused by Roger Sherman of Connecticut, a states' rights advocate at the convention, and was later espoused by Thomas Jefferson in his uh, memorandum to Washington opposing the First Bank of the United States. And that was that the General Welfare Clause was meant to limit the taxing power. And it was simply explaining that, the tax, that taxes could only be raised uh, to promote the, the national defense, uh, the common defense and general welfare. The other interpretation on the other side of the spectrum that I call the general welfare interpretation is that Congress can legislate on any matter of national concern. Well, let's look at the language uh, quickly. The phrase provide for is not the most naturally, is not most naturally understood to mean spend. That's a tertiary definition of the word provide. Um, the primary and secondary definitions of provide or to, are to furnish or supply or to see to in advance. In the constitutional context, that latter definition would mean to legislate, particularly when the word for is added. And in fact, Article 1, Section 8 uses the phrase provide for in three other places. And all of them clearly mean to make laws for to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting, to provide for calling forth the militia, and to provide for organizing uh, the militia and governing them. The word provide by itself without the word for appears in five other places in the constitution and in not one of those places does the word mean only spend. In fact, at the constitutional convention, there was no discussion whatsoever about an independent spending power Instead, the delegates assumed that there would be a spending power and discussed only ways to limit it. And when they did discuss uh, limiting uh, federal spending, they used the word appropriate, not provide, such as to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a term longer than two years. So what are the textual arguments against the general welfare interpretation? They essentially boil down to two. The first one is the argument from enumerationism, which is a, a word that I use to talk about the idea or ideology of limited enumerated powers. 
Madison argued in Federalist 41 that if the general welfare clause were interpreted to authorize Congress to legislate on all national problems, the remaining enumerated powers would be reduced to mere surplusage. They'd be meaningless and functionless. But that argument simply ignores the common drafting technique of, of using a general term and then following it with a list of particulars. What uh, Antonin Scalia and Brian Garner in their book on um, uh, statutory interpretation call a belt and suspenders approach. The enumeration is not surplus at all, but it has a function. It puts beyond argument that certain subjects come within the general welfare power, even though um, uh, you know, there may be others that are not enumerated. Now, it's true that a general welfare power is inconsistent with the idea of limited enumerated powers, but that would be a circular argument against the general welfare interpretation. If we assume that Article I, Section 8 embodies limited enumerated powers, we simply assume away rather than disproving the general welfare interpretation. Second, you can read Clause 1 as dealing with revenue issues only, money coming in, taxing, and money going out, spending. That's certainly a plausible uh, interpretation, but again, it fails to uh, provide a satisfying explanation for the use of the ambiguous word provide. There's another way to look at Clause 1, uh, which is that the nationalist wing among the framers at the convention was concerned above all to solidify the place of the United States in a dangerous and threatening Atlantic world ringed on all sides by hostile European and Indian nations. Clause one can be seen as a broad introduction to the legislative powers by settling the three most important objectives of the new government, the power to tax, the power to restore credit by paying the debts, and the power to preserve the union by defending it militarily and reigning in disharmonious state legislation through powers to regulate national concerns. In fact, each of these three subjects, taxes, debts, and the general welfare had different origins and different pathways into clause one at the convention and they arrive separately, which supports interpreting clause one as a grant, not solely of the power to tax, not of, of two powers to tax and spend, but of three powers to tax, to pay the debts and to legislate for the general welfare. The taxing power was the first listed power in the uh, article dealing with the legislative powers of Congress, starting with the well-known Committee of Detail draft of August 6th, presented to the convention on August 6th. The debt paying power arose in August later when the delegates debated the controversial issue of whether the new national government would pay off the state's Revolutionary War debt, a key element of the nationalist program ultimately adopted by the first Congress. On August 23rd, the convention, in fact, voted to enumerate a federal obligation to assume the state debts as the very first enumerated power. Now, scholars typically assume that the Committee of Detail completed its work when on August 6th, it submitted a draft constitution compiling all the resolutions adopted up to that point. But in fact, that five-man Committee of Detail issued a second report on August 22nd. That report has been hiding in plain sight for two centuries, ever since the publication of the convention journals in 1820. Um, and that proposed a significant amendment to the Necessary and Proper Clause, that basically at the end of the Necessary and Proper Clause, it was proposed to add that Congress would also have the power to provide, as may become necessary from time to time, for the well managing and securing the property and general interests and welfare of the United States. Now, this language was probably written by James Wilson uh, in his 1785 pamphlet on the implied powers that justified a federal charter of the Bank of North America under the Articles of Confederation. Wilson had argued that the well-managing and general welfare language of the articles conferred implied powers on the general government to do anything that the states were not competent to do. This uh, proposal was not voted on, but it was instead referred to a committee known as the Committee of Postponed Parts that included Roger Sherman, Governor Morris, and James Madison. By August in the convention, um, all of the controversial matters, most of them at least were being hashed out in committees um, and, and their, their deliberations are not summarized in Farron's records. At, um, Madison did not make notes of his committee work. Um, and the Committee of Postponed Parts 
is most famous for creating the Electoral College, and that notorious innovation probably obscured its other work. But on September 4th, the Committee of Postponed Parts reported out the version of Clause 1 that we have today. So just to conclude, what do we make of this? Here, is the, here are the changes. They watered down this uh, debt paying obligation to make it general to, in tone. And they shifted the general welfare clause from the necessary and proper clause to clause one, which made it seem more ambiguous. It left it open to this uh, more limited interpretation advocated by Roger Sherman. In the end, both sides of the compromise declared victory. The ultra-nationalist Governor Morris told a fellow delegate on September 6th that the general welfare clause would authorize the national government to create monopolies. Uh, Roger Sherman, for his part, uh, in a post uh, convention post-mortem, wrote that, um, you know, that basically uh, the objects for which Congress may uh, tax um, are limited to the common defense and general welfare. Uh, I think in some, the plain language favored Morris's, Morris's general welfare power interpretation, but it was sufficiently ambiguous to leave room for narrower secondary interpretations. None of this compels the general welfare interpretation today, but if we're to follow the intent of the framers, we would acknowledge that a general welfare power to legislate on all national matters is at least arguably granted by the general welfare clause. Thank you all for those extraordinarily rich presentations. I'm just going to make a few comments before we open things up to questions. And again, you can indicate that you have a question by putting a queue in the in the queue in the chat function. Let me start with Professor Schwartz's paper. Like William Krosky, Professor Schwartz argues that the first clause in Article 1, Section 8 empowers Congress to make any laws that promote the general welfare. His arguments are provocative in the best sense. And he anticipates the counter arguments that people might raise. But I do want to question whether his interpretation of the clause is really the most natural reading of the literal language, a point that he establishes with the quotation from James Madison's letter to Stevenson, but that I'm not sure is totally true. And Madison, of course, is an opponent of this interpretation. I want to compare two different readings of the clause. Read one way, the text of the clause is all about the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. Maybe the text implies a power to spend the money that is collected, or maybe the spending power comes instead from the necessary and proper clause. But on this first reading, the text itself is all about the power to tax. Read another way, the text of the clause confers three separate powers, the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, the power to pay the debts, and the power to provide for the common defense and general welfare. The clause could be read either way, but for a few different reasons, reading the clause to be all about the power to tax seems a little bit more natural to me than reading it to confer three separate powers. First, the restriction at the end of the clause saying that all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States, that's definitely a restriction on the power to tax. Professor Schwartz doesn't think that the location of that restriction is all that significant, and I agree that it's not some sort of slam dunk argument, but I do think it slightly supports the idea that the clause is all about the power to tax. If the clause were conferring other powers as well, I would expect this restriction to be grouped with the power to tax rather than to come after the other powers. Second, the word to appears twice in the clause. If the clause were conferring three separate powers, I think that the word two should appear either one more time or one less time. Suppose you wanted to give Congress the power to lay and collect taxes, the power to pay the debts, and the power to provide for the common defense and general welfare. I could see expressing that point as I just did with a two in front of each separate verb phrase, or I could see using the word two only once. Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare. But the actual language says Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, to pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare. I don't think that's the syntax you would use for three parallel verb phrases. Instead, the syntax suggests, at least to me, that the phrase pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare is all one unit which strikes me as a clue that the word to in front of that unit means in order to. 
Again, that's far from a slam dunk, but I do think it's a pointer. Third, I think that the tenor of the rest of Article 1, Section 8 is also a pointer. That's not exactly the presumption against surplusage. I agree with Professor Schwartz that even if the Constitution gives Congress a free-floating power to provide for the general welfare of the United States, it wouldn't be superfluous to include additional clauses specifying that Congress can do this, that, and the other thing, just to avoid arguments about whether particular exercises of those powers do or do not promote the general welfare. Still, the tenor of the overall list suggests to me that Congress is not being given an overarching power to do whatever is for the common good. If Congress were being given that overarching power, I as a drafter wouldn't bother to say that Congress also has the power to fix the standard of weights and measures or to establish post offices and post roads. The fact that the rest of Article 1, Section 8 goes into pretty precise detail strikes me as a, at least a modest point against the general welfare interpretation. Again, not a slam dunk refutation. In honor of the paper about interconstitutional interpretation from the earlier session, let me also mention what James Madison said was the source of the general welfare language in the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation. Article 8 said that all charges of war and all other expenses that shall be incurred for the common defense or general welfare and allowed by the United States in Congress assembled shall be defrayed out of a common treasury. And the same article indicated that each state was to raise its share of the money for that treasury by laying and levying taxes. So at least in the Articles of Confederation, the language about the common defense or general welfare appeared in a provision about taxing and spending. I haven't done justice to Professor Schwartz's analysis. You all should read the paper, but my time is flitting away. So I'm gonna move on to Professor Graber's paper. Professor Graber canvasses the different doctrinal regimes that American courts have used over time to analyze laws that are explicitly race conscious. He names those regimes after different court cases but of course, constitutional amendments affected the regimes too. And one of the really nice features of Professor Graeber's paper is its discussion of the fact that, in his words, doctrines, institutional authority, and textual hooks come in packages. And that's true even if people are not focusing on individual clauses in specific arguments. It matters whether the court runs its analysis primarily through one clause or a different clause, through the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment or the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. And it also matters whether and how analysis takes account of the 13th Amendment. Just to recap Professor Graeber's categories, he considers the legal treatment of race conscious laws under what he calls the Costin Manuel regime before the Civil War, and hence before the Civil War amendments, the Turner regime, named for a case that Chief Justice Chase decided on circuit under the 13th Amendment before the 14th Amendment was ratified, the Strouder regime, which emphasized the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Plessy regime, which also centered on the Equal Protection Clause, but sought to distinguish forbidden race discriminations from potentially permissible race distinctions, and what Professor Graeber calls the Korematsu regime, that is the modern regime of strict scrutiny for all laws that classify people on the basis of race. For whatever it's worth, I would change that last label. I might call modern strict scrutiny the McLaughlin regime after the 1964 case of McLaughlin versus Florida rather than the Korematsu regime. It's true that Korematsu introduced some of the vocabulary of strict scrutiny, which was also developing in First Amendment doctrine around the same time. The court said that, quote, all legal restrictions which curtail the civil rights of a single racial group are immediately suspect and courts must subject them to the most rigid scrutiny. But as Professor Graeber notes, the scrutiny that the court applied in Korematsu just focused on whether the restriction served a sufficiently important purpose, not whether there was a close fit between that end and the government's chosen means. The modern version of strict scrutiny for racial classifications didn't really emerge until the 1960s. If the court had applied the modern version of strict scrutiny in Korematsu itself, the case almost certainly would have come out the other way. To me, it's jarring to use the, the name of such an anti-canonical case as the label for modern doctrine, 
And I think that it would be more accurate to associate modern doctrine with McLaughlin than with Korematsu. More important than labels, though, Professor Graeber's excavation of the different features of prior doctrinal frameworks highlights questions that the current framework obscures. Questions about the respective roles of Congress and the courts, about the ongoing role that the 13th Amendment could play, about whether racial classification should be categorically forbidden or simply scrutinized, and more. Some of those questions, especially relating to the interaction between the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, also feed into Professor Schmidt's analysis. Like Professor Graeber, Professor Schmidt highlights historical discussions of the interconnection between the 13th and 14th Amendments. That interconnection is clear. Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1866 under the authority of the 13th Amendment. And one of the goals of the 14th Amendment was either to constitutionalize that act or at least to shore up Congress's power to enact it. The distinction between civil rights and other kinds of rights certainly came up in discussions of the 14th Amendment. And indeed, it's why people thought that the 15th Amendment was necessary too. At least according to one strain of thought, the 14th Amendment dealt only with civil rights and did not require equality with respect to political rights, like the right to vote. Professor Schmidt nicely brings out the contested nature of those categories and the debates between people who understood the category of civil rights more or less capaciously. As a doctrinal matter, one of the seminal cases emphasized by Professor Graeber, Strader versus West Virginia, may have helped to de-emphasize the category of civil rights. In the ideology of civic republicanism, eligibility to serve on a jury was linked to eligibility to vote. And both were often regarded as political rather than civil rights. Yet the majority in Strader indicated that West Virginia's racial restrictions on jury service violated the Equal Protection Clause, and the majority held that the defendant in Strader had been eligible to remove his prosecution from state to federal court under the federal statute authorizing removal when the defendant was denied or couldn't enforce in the state courts, quote, any rights secured to him by any law providing for the equal civil rights of citizens of the United States. On the other hand, the dissenters in Strader and a companion case emphasized the distinction between civil and political rights. Professor Schmidt is well aware that in the 19th century, people who invoked the distinction between civil rights and political or social rights often did so in order to limit the reach of the 14th Amendment in a way that was bad for racial equality. Professor Schmidt doesn't want to resurrect those particular distinctions. But at a more abstract level, he sees progressive potential in reading the 14th Amendment to impose a stronger non-discrimination requirement with respect to some spheres of human activity than with respect to others. That does suggest a question to me. If we take history to support distinguishing among different types of legal interests or different spheres of human activity, but we aren't trying to draw quite the same distinctions that the early thinking did, how should we identify the distinctions that we do want judges to draw and what role does history play in that analysis? I also wonder about the consequences of pushing doctrine in this direction. Maybe that's related to Professor Graeber's point about packages. If the court were to infuse 13th Amendment ideas into its interpretation of the 14th Amendment, it might expand the 14th Amendment in some respects, as by rethinking the state action limitation in some important areas, but it might also weaken the constraints that the 14th Amendment is currently understood to impose in areas of the law that aren't at the core of the historical conception of civil rights. I've only scratched the surface of these papers, but I'm at the end of my 12 minutes, and it's better for us to hear from the panelists anyway than from me. If any of the panelists want to respond to what I've said or to each other, let's take a couple minutes to do that now, and then we can move on to questions. You should indicate your interest in asking a question in the chat. I'm happy to hear questions first. Let us do it. Um, So I'm not sure if Professor Kaplan um, has a question or would like to would like to speak. Um, I don't see anybody with an explicit cue in the in the chat. I think Mr. Lynch, Miles Lynch, has a hand. 
Oh, excellent. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't actually sure how to cue. Um, I had a question for Professor Schwartz, um, kind of following up on something that was just said in the commentary. Um, you said in the in your paper that you're reporting out the um, the committee on postponed parts language and how but for capitalization and substituting Congress for legislature, that's the final version. Um, I'm curious on the, the natural reading and the two argument that the first two being capitalized and the second two not being capitalized makes it more natural to read the capital two as the first item in the list as with the following enumerated powers of section eight um, and then the second two to be a more causal spring from the first one. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, on the disparate capitalization in, of the twos in that clause. Yeah, I, I do have some thoughts. Um, so, you know, James Madison uh, in the debate over the first bank of the United States made his famous quote, not every um, omission and insertion in the constitution was the product of, of deliberation. And um, you know, any of us who have uh, written, a, let's say, a final exam for our for our students, and then found to our dismay that there was some unintended ambiguity that the students found and messed them up and caused complaints in the you know in the exam taking process, um, you know, we know that what it's like to draft quickly and under pressure, and. Um, there's a sense in which to me, uh, the, the really fine pointed, you know, kind of syntactical arguments about how to read the clause, um, you know, don't give enough, I think, attention to the fact that uh, this was a massive drafting project of somewhere between, you know, 39 and 55 delegates at one time or another on numerous topics. Um, and that you know the finishing touches were put on in great haste and under this great pressure to be done and to leave um, you know the uh, this miasma of of a city of Philadelphia. Um, so I think if you if you carefully scrutinize the uses of prepositions in the um, in Article One, Section Eight, you'll find some inconsistency. Um, they 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 use doublets um, you know to uh, and I talk about these in the paper, um, to declare war, grant letters of mark, and make rules. So you don't have two, uh, you don't have a, a full infinitive in front of, uh, in front of every verb. Um, but then there's also um, some inconsistency there. There's counterexamples to that. So, you know, I don't make too much of, uh, uh, you know, of, of sort of the, um, the use of the word too. As far as capitalization goes, um, that's a, a very strange thing because, um, the uh, you know the the committee of style um, put out a, a broadsheet. It was printed by a local printer and distributed to all the delegates. And it had one set of punctuation and capitalization um, that was changed by the engrosser when it was handwritten and then signed by the delegates. Um, and then something different from that was then sent to the states for ratification. And capitalization was all over the place. Um, and so we don't know who made capitalization decisions. In the draft that we're looking at, you know, um, was it made by the committee of style? Was it made by the printer? Was it made by the engrosser? Um, you know, so I, I just don't think that there's a lot of substance to be gained from that. And the final point is that, um, and this is a, something that that uh, uh, Caleb Nelson mentioned, um, this this clause at the end about you know all taxes shall be uniform. Um, Caleb is not the first person to read that as a as a uh, a marker that, or pointer, as he says, that this whole clause is about taxing. But we should take into account the fact that that phrase was added on September 14th to the Committee of Style draft. One day, uh, on the second to last day of debate, debate concluded on September 15th. And it wasn't the first time that um, some kind of limitation on the taxing power had been tacked onto the taxing power and the convention. Previ the previous two occasions when that happened, they eventually got moved by the Committee of Style into Article 1, Section 9. Well, the Committee of Style didn't have another crack at this after September 14th. So this amendment was just stuck onto the Committee of Style draft for convenience in that spot. And, you know, 
Governor Morris or whoever on the Committee of Style didn't have a chance to move it into the limitations in Article 1, Section 9, where the other limitations on taxing were placed. So I don't think there's too much that can be inferred from that either as a matter of intentions. You know, the, by the way, my argument is only addressing intentions at this stage. And in terms of, you know, if you're an original public meaning originalist and you think all that matters is, you know, what did the words mean to the readers during the ratification process, you know, that's the next article. I have Aaron Kaplan and then Andrew Cohen. Again, if you want to ask a question, you can just type the word, type the letter Q in the chat. Aaron Kaplan. Hi, um, I have a question for Professor, Stella. excuse me. Maybe I should have left myself muted. <laughs> so for Professor Schwartz, uh, you know, I had, I had always been taught that this isn't a general welfare clause and there's, uh, it hasn't really been used that way. So I'm wondering since between you and Professor Nelson, I see that there are arguments in both directions, why, does it seem like the, there's been a rejection of the general welfare interpretation? It seems to have happened early and it seems to be very tenacious. So um, why did one interpretation seem to crush the other? My answer to that, which is outside the scope of the paper because of you know, word limits is, um, you know, federalists were arguing in Congress for the general welfare power as late as the uh, debates on the uh, Alien and Sedition uh, Acts in, in uh, 1798. I think, that, I think the turning point was the election of 1800. And I think the decisive political victory of the Jeffersonian party um, basically stamped out a number of federalist interpretations of the constitution and really kind of solidified uh, a political, a victory in constitutional politics for limited enumerated powers that has really made it very difficult for us to go back and, and read uh, these clauses without confirmation bias. Andrew Cohen. Well, thank you all. These are really terrific papers. I've enjoyed the discussion greatly so far. My question is uh, for Mark Graber. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how and why legislative primacy drops out of the picture so dramatically and suddenly in Plessy. The bad news is you've just asked an academic to say a little more. Um, you don't mind if we go to 7.30 instead of ending at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time tonight. No, the one reason why, at least I'll argue, is in fact in the mid-19th century, we're at a time where the dominant mover of constitutional ideas is party. So it's really crucial in David's account that the Federalists lose out to the Jeffersonians. And in fact, constitutional doctrine is largely made by Jeffersonians, largely made by Jacksonians. If we read Lincoln's first inaugural without contemporary blinkers, Lincoln never says, I'm the president, I can overturn the court. What he says both here and Dred Scott, I am the leader of the victorious party. And the center of the party is in the legislature. What happens is the programmatic parties, Democratic and Republicans weaken they become non-ideological. Increasingly, these non-ideological parties empower courts. We develop an increased sense of the old Whig idea that courts have the final authority. So Plessy, Lochner, reflect an understanding of judicial power that was highly contested when the 13th and 14th Amendment were ratified. And this, in fact, is I'm working on a big manuscript that tries to recapture that world. And it's one of the reasons I actually want to say that I'm not advocating, aha, we should go back to this world. I'm saying here are a set of assumptions we no longer have. We can't go back. I don't see other questions in the queue. So let me pose one to the, to the three panelists. It occurs to me one feature that links the, the three papers or one question that might be common to them all is about the relevance of settled precedent. So Professor Schwartz's paper advocates 
what at least I think of as a change in settled doctrine, right? The Supreme Court, I think, has not signed on to the general welfare interpretation. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of statements about enumeration and so forth. Um, how, to the extent that the clause is ambiguous, what weight should that doctrine have as you're deciding whether to shift to the general welfare interpretation? And you could ask the same sort of question of Professor Schmidt, right? The tiers of scrutiny that the Supreme Court has come up with to implement the 14th Amendment surely weren't compelled by the text of the Constitution, but they also aren't necessarily forbidden by the text. And they're pretty well established in Supreme Court doctrine. I know there are you know, leading cases that are hard to fit into that framework. But if you're a lower court judge, you probably think in, in a lot of different types of cases, you're supposed to use the, the tiers of scrutiny. Um, that seems like a fairly well established feature of current doctrine um, for, for most kinds of cases that, that implicate those issues. Could the court just scrap them tomorrow if it wanted to? Or what's the weight of doctrine with respect to that question? And of course, Professor Graber's paper suggests you know, we have had different doctrinal regimes at different times. The court can scrap doctrinal regimes, but how should we think about the pull of precedent on those questions? That might be a question for all three panelists. Yeah, so maybe I'll jump in to start off. Um, so one thing I'm trying to do in this project is um, to understand when settled precedent doesn't actually explain cases that we generally agree or rightly decided, right? So something here has to do with, you have respect for settled precedent, but also recognize you need moments of transition in which the precedent doesn't fully decide it. And then the question I was trying to focus on is, what are the terms of the debate that you have about when you have one of these transitional cases, right? Whether it's a Buchanan, a Shelley, Brown, Obergefell, Plyler. Um, and it does seem to me that oftentimes when you have judges trying to work with old rules that don't fit the case at hand, um, you know, I'm kind of fatalistic. They know where they're going to go in terms of the outcome of the case. And they're trying to justify it with the tools they have at hand. And when the precedents don't line up, uh, things kind of fall apart, right? And I do think the reasoning of the cases identified as the rule breakers are not, um, the reasoning they offer is not very satisfactory in terms of the justifications that are giving based on the precedents. And it does seem to me that we have an alternative, which has this genealogy, which has trait can be traced back. Um, so it's less about when the court is gonna move away from precedent or not. And it's more about the way in which the court explains and justifies that move if we accept the fact that there are certain cases in which they're gonna to need to push off in a new direction. I would say that, um, you know, we have plenty of examples to look at for, um, major departures from precedent. Um, so, you know, it starts by one judge is convinced by this idea, wants to go back to first principles or whatever. We see Clarence Thomas doing that with the Commerce Clause starting in Lopez, and they kind of seed a number of separate opinions with these ideas that might catch on. Um, uh, maybe one less dramatic example is the Salo Law case from last term, where um, you know, they've functionally, uh, though not in name, overruled uh, decades of, um, of doctrine on the appoint on the removal power and gone back to the Myers case of 1926. I think um, when it comes to limited enumerated powers, there's two things going on. One is that the doctrine of limited, limited enumerated powers um, is, is extremely weak in most areas and only strong at the margins uh, because of the way the Commerce Clause has been interpreted. Um, though those margins could be pretty striking, um, you know, in the case of something like uh, striking down a national mask mandate during the pandemic. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I think that the analogy for um, a departure, you know, if the court were to abandon um, limited enumerated powers in favor of a general welfare interpretation, it would require um, the, coal the gelling of the kinds of forces that had to gel in 1937 to 41, um, when we kind of overturned the longstanding uh, interpretation of the limits on the commerce power. You know, there would have to be a liberal court, uh, there would have to be a political crisis, um, et cetera. So much of what's going on is less upholding precedent or disregarding precedent 
then working within precedent and pres you know, we pointed out precedential ambiguities and taking them one way rather than another. So consider the transition from the general tendency of courts to say, this is what the constitution means, look at all these provisions, to the tendency to say it's rooted in this provision. And a lot of things are going on. One is the professionalization of the legal profession. Law schools being taught, ah, this is what this provision means. Thomas Cooley, a treatise. We got this provision, we got this provision. Things like that are going on. The cases are unclear. You can easily say, see, due process means this. Look at this case, even though this case actually says due process, equal protection, and two other things. So I think part of what we have is simply a way of working with precedent that is typical of the common law tradition. And I think David Strauss is largely right in saying, for the most part, American judges have treated the Constitution as a set of common law scriptures and interpret constitutional precedents the way a common law court would interpret ordinary precedents. And the result is you get, you know, what's, what's the game we played? Telephone we played as a kid. Somebody whispers, you know, a phrase and by the time it comes around, it's the Latin translation of the Constitution. You played in a higher level telephone game than I did. Um, Jeremy Tillman, and then if there's time, Steve Sachs. So uh, my question is for David, and it, I think it's a follow-up on Aaron. Um, I mean, one of your first footnotes places your scholarship uh, in the context of other similar scholarship that's argued for expansive interpretations of um, the necessary and proper clause, um, commerce powers, right? So Jack Balkan focuses on commerce po powers. I think John McHale, uh, Richard Primus, Robert Reinstein, uh, all, are, all, all focus on um, enumeration. Um, sorry, no, uh, Primus and Reinstein talk about enumeration. So I'm just, I'm wondering, I mean, you gave a quick answer having to do with the political chain in the election of 1800. Does that also address why these, these recent arguments that um, people have made based on research into the, uh, the, the, the early Republic um, took so long to discover? Did they just disappear after the election of 1800? I, I think they did um, because, you know, and, and, you know, the proof of that is the, is the um, constitutional arguments made by Henry Clay and the National Republicans in the 1820s for things like um, the internal improvements for building up national infrastructure. Um, they, they went for the spending power and, you know, the arguments kind of shifted to a spending power interpretation and away from a, you know, a broad national legislative power. So I have a question in the chat from Steve Sachs, who is on kid duty and therefore does not want to take the risk of unmuting himself. So he has asked me to pose the following question, which I think again is for David. Steve is curious about what the separation of powers implications of the general welfare interpretation would be. He says the horizontal necessary and proper clause may contain certain limits on Congress's ability to regulate the other branches. And I think that would be about the idea that proper builds in some separation of powers limitations. So if Congress is enacting regulations of the other branches pursuant to its power under the necessary and proper clause, there'd be some kind of limitation on what's proper, some separation of powers idea. Steve is curious whether a general welfare reading would preserve those limits or remove them. I, um, I've never bought the idea that the word proper um, ha does um, independent um, doctrinal work that necessary and proper is a doublet. It had a, it was just a, it, it didn't have that kind of precise meaning and th that constitutional, internal constitutional limits like separation of powers would apply whether that word that was there or not. And so I don't think it would have any uh, impact on that. 
on, on September. That we are at we are at 2:30. Join me in thanking the panelists. That was a wonderful discussion, and I look forward to the next panel. <laughs>